Welcome to the Voice of America Bethany Relay Station. Relay Station was Voice of America's term for transmitter plant, of which there were 15 around the world in the mid-1990s. Overseas transmitter plants were closer to their target areas, making more reliable, stronger signals in those target areas. In the United States, there were three transmitter plants operating in the 1990s. Bethany, where you are now, the oldest, Delano, California, also built during World War II, and Greenville, North Carolina, the largest plant. The history of broadcasting in Cincinnati, both on the standard AM broadcast band and on shortwave, goes back many years before World War II. The Bethany Station is a direct result of radio broadcasting by Adolf Hitler in World War II. Adolf Hitler and the Nazi Party, the Third Reich, came to power in 1932. Under Adolf Hitler, Joseph Goebbels, his Minister of Communications and Propaganda, made the statement that radio would be to the 20th century what the press was to the 19th. Goebbels understood the value of radio broadcasting. Goebbels wanted every German citizen to hear only the message of the Third Reich, the message of half-truths, distortions, the very anti-Semitic message. So in order to do so, it was very easy to put all the German radio stations on a network and broadcast the same thing at the same time, but everybody needed a radio receiver. Radio receivers were quite expensive in the 1930s, around $100 of U.S. value. The German economy was in recession, as well as most of Europe was in the early 1930s, and the average person could not afford a $100 radio receiver. It was Goebbels who came up with the idea of a very cheaply built, government-subsidized radio receiver, which became one of the people's projects. There were many people's projects in Germany. We've all heard of the Volkswagen, the people's car. Goebbels' radio was the Volksempfanger, the people's receiver. This is a picture of the very first model, the 1932 model, of the Volksempfanger, and a poster featuring that particular radio receiver. All Germany, here's the Fuhrer, here's Hitler's speeches, with the People's Receiver. People's Receiver was very cheaply built. Only three vacuum tubes were in the receiver. Most radio receivers had more than three tubes. The more tubes that were in your radio receiver, the more sensitive and selective it was, meaning you could hear stations from farther away and separate stations that were close together. The Volksempfanger was built for one purpose, listening to your local German radio station. It was not a sensitive receiver. However, a few people discovered that if you attached a very long wire to the Volksempfanger receiver, you were able to listen to London and you were able to listen to Moscow. A thing which many people did, but it was very carefully hidden. And if you learned something that the German government didn't want you to know, you did not discuss it with your neighbors. Here is a picture of the second model of the Volksempfanger and another poster featuring that particular radio receiver. The original Volksempfanger just had a round tuning dial with number 0 to 100 and later on they became more sophisticated. Every Volksempfanger receiver came with this orange tag attached to the tuning knob. It is unlawful to listen to radio stations from other countries. If you are caught doing so, it's punishable by prison and hard labor. A very ominous warning on your radio receiver. Here is a picture of a typical German family sitting around in the evening. Dad's reading the newspaper, mom's catching up on the knitting, but there is that Volksempfanger playing in the background. Next is the very last version of the Volksempfanger receiver. This one added, in addition to standard AM broadcasting band, added longwave. Longwave stations were used all over Europe as a longwave station propagates the same daytime and nighttime. If you can hear a longwave station in the day, you can hear it just as well at night. This radio receiver added a slide rule type tuning dial with a pointer that moved left and right and was much more stylish. Around 1932, U.S. manufacturers began adding shortwave capability to the radio receivers because of an interest shown by U.S. citizens in shortwave. Shortwave broadcasting had been used in this country in the 1920s and 30s. However, it was not commercially profitable. There were not enough listeners to shortwave 
to make it possible to sell commercials on the radio. Here we have a picture of WLW's shortwave transmitter in 1931, operating with 10,000 watts of power from two miles down the road at the WLW transmitter plant. It simulcast WLW's AM signal and was heard all over the world. In 1937, Crosley Broadcasting here in Cincinnati, owners and operators of WLW and WSAI, decided to increase the power of the shortwave transmitter. Here we have a picture of the brand new transmitter designed in 1937 by R.J. Rockwell. R.J. Rockwell is on the left side of the picture along with Floyd Lancer, the transmitter plant supervisor. This transmitter was capable of 50,000 watts. Here we see a picture of the rhombic shortwave antenna between the transmitter building and the diamond-shaped Blahnox Tower. This antenna pointed toward Latin America. On the west side of the building, another antenna was constructed of the rhombic type also pointed toward Europe. The little building in the photo was the tuning house for the shortwave antenna pointed toward Europe and still exists today as the tuning house for the WLW auxiliary antennas right beside it. All of the studios for WLW, WSAI, and W8XAL were on the 8th floor of this building. The 7 floors below it were all manufacturing for the Crosley Manufacturing Company where they built radio receivers in Cincinnati. In 1938, in addition to broadcasting English, they also broadcast in Spanish to Latin America. They found that there were many thousands of listeners listening to the shortwave signal around the world, and when they requested for people to write in and tell where they were listening, they got thousands of postcards. I've picked out just eight of those postcards, which do not particularly reflect faraway places or particularly interesting pictures. They're just the top eight off the pile. The first four are from Guatemala, Michigan, Cuba, and El Salvador. The second four are from Mexico, Mexico, Venezuela, and Brazil. In 1938, the Federal Communications Commission changed all of the experimental shortwave licenses and their call letters, such as W8XAL, to regular-looking call letters and licenses, and W8XAL became WLWO. The Crosley engineers in 1938 also made some improvements to the shortwave transmitter and increased its output power from 50,000 watts to 70,000 watts, making it the country's most powerful shortwave transmitter. 1939-1940, other languages were added to the WLWO transmissions. Crosley Broadcasting hired a German announcer, a French announcer, and an Italian announcer and began broadcasting to Europe. In addition to broadcasting to Europe, WLWO started an afternoon siesta program, which was carried for an hour every day in the Spanish language to all over Latin America. The shortwave transmitter was used as a relay transmitter, and this program was picked up by 10 different Latin American stations and broadcast locally. WLWO was not the only shortwave broadcasting station operating in the 1940s in the country. Other broadcasters became quite concerned about the amount of propaganda on the short wave being broadcast by the German government. 1935, Hitler began bombarding Latin America in the Spanish language, calling for several countries to declare war on the United States. This was a diversionary tactic. Luckily, none of those countries ever declared war on the U.S. in the 1930s. But if the U.S. had been fighting a few skirmishes in Latin America, they would not be watching what Hitler was doing as he was taking over country after country in Europe. The only other station in 1939 broadcasting on a daily basis was the General Electric station in San Francisco. This station, originally licensed as W6BEX, became KGEI in 1938. Note the GE in the middle of the call letters. KGEI began broadcasting in English to the Far East at night during primetime evening hours and broadcasting to Latin America in the Spanish language during primetime evening hours in Latin America. Other stations joined in 1940 and 41. By 1938, Hitler had developed a massive radio broadcasting effort. His broadcasting headquarters was located in Ciesen, and there they had all of the studios, engineers, technicians, transmitters to produce 24 hours a day of German propaganda. In addition to long wave, medium wave, and short wave transmitters, there were complete orchestras, bands, 
music writers, poets, authors, everybody needed to produce 24 hours a day of German propaganda to the world. In this location, there were 1,000 employees for the sole purpose of producing German radio propaganda. With the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, and the declaration of war, everything changed. Under President FDR, there were two agencies responsible for dissemination of information to the world. Nelson Rockefeller was the coordinator of information for the United States government. Nelson Rockefeller was in charge of everything to Latin America. He was so interested in Latin America that he took Spanish language lessons and became fluent in the Spanish language. The other agency was the Federal Information Service under William Donovan. William Donovan was a World War I hero, became a prominent Wall Street attorney, and worked under FDR disseminating U.S. information to the rest of the world. The coordinator of information and the Federal Information Service were rolled into a brand new agency called the Office of War Information. Elmer Davis was brought in to run the OWI. He reported directly to FDR. Robert Sherwood, the well-known actor, author, radio personality, was brought in to head the OWI operations in Washington, D.C. William Houseman, the also well-known scriptwriter, actor, and radio producer, was brought in to head the OWI's radio studio operations, very hastily built at 140 Madison Avenue in New York City. One thing about William Donovan, as one of the leaders of the OWI, Donovan said, we are going to build this massive radio broadcasting organization. We can tell the world anything, and they will believe us. William Donovan was immediately overruled by Elmer Davis and FDR, said, no, 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 we will only broadcast the truth. The statement, tell the truth and let the world decide, came from the very earliest days of the OWI. The OWI realized they had to very quickly start broadcasting war information to both Europe and Asia, and they very quickly took over all of the existing shortwave transmitters in this country. This is a map of the existing 13 shortwave transmitters operating in this country on Pearl Harbor Day. Here is a schedule of newscasts in the English language that could be heard in Great Britain from British magazine Wireless World, published in March 1942. You can see the RCA, General Electric, and Crosley WLWO here in Cincinnati. The first day of broadcasting from the new Office of War Information Studios was scheduled for February 23, 1942. Broadcast lines were installed to all the shortwave transmitters in the United States, and this was called the Bronze Network. By February 23rd, only two of the four studios were completed. Announcers on the first day of broadcasting had to slide in and out of chairs behind the microphones when languages were changed. The WLWO announcers in Cincinnati were informed that they would no longer be broadcasting from Cincinnati, and the three European language announcers were offered jobs by the OWI. Leaving Cincinnati on the night train on the 22nd of February were Giorgio Padovano, the Italian announcer, Edward Beck, the French announcer, and Robert Bauer, the German announcer. Robert Bauer had a very interesting life, and to find out more, look him up on Wikipedia. On the way to New York, the train was delayed by an accident and arrived many hours late. They were scheduled to be in New York at 6 a.m., check into a hotel, and get a little rest before going on the air at noon, but the train did not arrive until 10 a.m., so they very quickly went from Grand Central Station to the OWI studios for the first broadcast. There have always been some questions about who actually did the very first OWI broadcast in the German language. The first broadcast in the German language was done by William Harland Hale at 2.30 in the morning on February 23rd. The famous words, Daily at this time we shall bring you news about the war. The news may be good or bad. We shall tell you the truth. Until 1942, WLWO was still using very short antennas built on the WLW property. They told the OWI that they needed full-size broadcast antennas pointed toward Europe and Latin America, so they were given the go-ahead to construct four full-size shortwave broadcast antennas across Tylersville Road on the Everybody's Farm property, which Crosley Broadcasting already owned. Here is a picture of some of the shortwave antennas, and you can see on the right side WLW's Blahnox diamond-shaped tower and two towers on the north side of Tylersville Road, which were still WSAI's broadcast tower. Crosley folks also said, we think we can do more with an additional transmitter. 
So they found a modulator and a power supply in Lincoln, Nebraska, shipped it to Cincinnati, bought an RF tuning deck from the RCA factory in Camden, New Jersey, and homemade a second shortwave transmitter licensed as WLWK at the WLW Mason transmitter plant. The OWI realized that on Pearl Harbor Day, Hitler had 68 radio transmitters under his control, long wave, medium, short wave. Japanese had 42 radio transmitters. This country had a total of 13 radio transmitters, vastly outnumbered by the Germans. The OWI realized they had to start broadcasting with much more power in order to counteract Hitler's propaganda. So 